Hey, hi. Welcome to Someone Else's Movie, the original podcast where an actor, writer, director, or nebulous industry figure gives a little love to a movie they didn't make. I'm Norm Wilner, I'm a programmer at TIFF now, and this is The Other Thing I Do. Events conspired last week to keep me from producing a new episode, but as it happens, I had something great in the vault. Justin Benson and Aaron Moorhead on Cameron Crowe's Almost Famous, recorded in 2015 when they came to Toronto to open their brilliant horror romance, Spring. Aaron and Justin have been having a really good year. They premiered their fifth feature, Something in the Dirt, at Sundance in January, then applied their specific weirdness of vision to a couple of episodes of Marvel's Moon Knight series, demonstrating that they can function in that realm if they choose to. So now, with Something in the Dirt opening in New York and Los Angeles on Friday and coming to VOD in Canada November 22nd, I thought I'd take the opportunity to recirculate this episode from when we were all younger, happier, and more innocent, celebrating Cameron Crowe's autobiographical coming-of-age story of rock and roll, puppy love, disillusionment, and ferocious parenting. This is someone else's movie. I mean, there's so, there's so many things we just say that we just love it. We've watched Cameron Crowe's director's cut, the one called Untitled. We've watched mm-hmm. it how many times together now? Three uh, times? Three or four times, Three yeah. or four times. We make other people watch it. We don't watch movies together very much, to be honest with you. Okay. Yeah, like, yeah. We don't... Yeah. yeah, it's it's kind of like uh, it, what's what's cool of, for me about it is I didn't quite grow up on it or anything like that. In fact, weirdly enough, I have I can't figure out my my actual physical emotional connection to it. Okay, um, because uh, I feel like most people like that movie when they like really love rock and roll and they're just like, oh, this is so cool. It's kind of like it's like me when I was a kid. And for me, like I was the weirdest kid you can imagine I listened to the Pirates of the Caribbean soundtrack like that was my music like I was a nerd like didn't care at all about rock and roll didn't care about the history of it none of it and so for me like I don't attach to the movie on that level at all like I except for the fact that I know that people like it a lot you know that's interesting but um so you know I'm trying to kind of figure it out because why would that be one of my favorite movies ever this movie about this topic that's so about the topic very very much about it and um, and I think it's genuinely is just it's it's like a movie that could be called saccharin if it weren't so human, you yeah. know. And it's just like oh I I you know there's not really any false beats in the movie, and that's really hard to do with something that's saccharin and also trying to tell a big story, which it kind of is. It's a you know road trip epic in many ways and yeah. rise and fall of rock stardom and um, and so I think that's. That impressed me so much as like, oh, you can have a movie that is sweet and human um, and so lovable, so incredibly lovable without it, you know, um, and and impactful without it being like the, the extraordinarily strong, like, tension drama of There Will Be Blood or something like that. You know, like, I feel like when I think of like an important movie, I think of There Will Be Blood, which is like one of my favorite movies of all time. Right. Um, but I would like put an equal importance I would put something like almost famous but but that one's light it's light it's not airy but it's light and that's because like the humanity and it's so real that you can get behind it no matter what yeah there is a curiosity in his films like there's a there's a similar vibe in spring in the last act where and I, we won't go into specific spoilers for spring but when confronted with something all someone wants to do is say well what about this and how about that and how do you do this and how does this come because those are the questions I ask in any movie and I'm so glad to see that you'd work them out, but deliver that exposition in a way that doesn't feel like exposition. You found a natural way to get it in there. And also, at that point, it's not really that important. Mm -hmm. But everybody in Almost Famous wants to know more about the thing. And if the thing is rock and roll, you can go anywhere. Like, you can literally take those questions into any direction. But the conversations that that the crow surrogate has with Lester Bangs um, are all about <laughs> that, right? He's afraid to ask a question that will make him seem uncool. Right. But he's treated with such honesty and, and sort of this blunt force realism that comes out of Philip Seymour Hoffman. And it's just, it's kind of heartbreaking in the rear view mirror, not because Hoffman's gone, but because nobody gets mentorship like that. Like mm-hmm. that doesn't happen. That's clearly Crow giving us a specific memory that he really treasures and, and wants to share with us. And that's what I mean. Like the, the greatest curiosity you can have going into Almost Famous is who's Cameron Crow, because this movie will tell you that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, that, that was something that, that for me, I, I've rediscovered the movie recently. I saw it one time growing up and I was like, 
and I had the reaction that you might expect as I was describing, where it's just like, oh, it's the rock and roll movie, and I don't really care that much about it. And then I rediscovered it, you know, a few years ago through Justin, and we've just watched it more than a few times since. And that was one of the big realizations of, like, you know, that is actually one of the crowning accomplishments of Philip Seymour Hoffman's extraordinarily accomplished career. Yeah. In that, in, you know, what, four scenes or something like that, he's created a character that's, like, so memorable and also says something in it, which is, you know, and and, and, uh, and it's exactly the conversation you're talking about where it's just like, yeah, because we're uncool. And, you know, and kind of, like, acceptance of that. And because no one talks about the uncool, they only talk about the cool, and then they lament being uncool. But there's no talk about, like... What's it like to be uncool, and is can you accept it, and is that okay, and does it matter even, you know? Um, and then you actually, you know, you can actually... It, the movie isn't just about being cool. In fact, that's almost the most surface level thing. But, oh, yeah. But it's about the... the it's about the, the feeling that we all have growing up, no matter if you are the cool guy, like, you're always just like, I'm so uncool. Um, <laughs> but I remember there's, there's something that we've, we've said jokingly to reporters on the way out or something when they do an interview... But we, we, it's the line from Almost Famous, just make us look cool, you know? <laughs> like, and I love that, where it's just like, that guy, in that little joke, is really vulnerable. Because he's cool no matter what, but he's just like begging this 16-year-old, 15-year-old, yeah. to... 15? Or which one? Where, yeah, what age does he 15, land I think 15. he hit 16 during the movie. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And he's, he's begging him to make him look cool. Just yeah. this little kid, and it's the kind of thing that the little kid saw and remembered, like because obviously that's like I don't doubt the authenticity of any of it. I believe that everything in the movie happened or almost happened in a way that is now dramatically thrilling. Mm-hmm. Um, in in a way that a lot of Crow's other films lately seem to feel like he's just showing me his record collection, but this is where he's showing me the record collection and telling me what it, all the songs mean to him and what he went through to be part of it. Mm-hmm. Um, John Hodgman uh, has this speech about, uh, it's, a, it's part of his uh, one-man show he's done, about how he went on the set of Battlestar Galactica in the first season as a reporter. He was writing a story for the New York Times Magazine about Ronald D. Moore, and then went back in season five because they wrote a part for him. He plays a veterinarian who operates as a brain surgeon after all humanity is wiped out. He's the closest thing they have. And he was talking about the, the incredible mirror image of himself, like, I've been here before, I've done this, but now I'm part of the crew and I'm... You know, they have a spice for me, and they're they're putting me through makeup, and I'm I'm a part of the culture that I have worked hard to absorb, and and because I love it, now I'm in it, mm-hmm. and that's what Almost Famous felt like to me, like the tunnel where you come out the other end as a filmmaker, and you choose to tell the story about the time you first realize you could be part of something, mm-hmm. and he's almost a hostage to it, like it's unconscious. He doesn't want to be part of the band, I don't think. I think he wants to be a reporter, but he's so. It just Eager loves the music. And, yeah, yeah, it's that thing where. Well, it's one thing that I can't believe in the movie that, that isn't a path that they didn't go down, that for like dramatic purposes you normally just have to go down, like even with Hydra, where we've got to. Um, but like, I don't think he really dances with corruption of his innocence too much. Yeah. You know? I mean, he grows up. He, it's, it's interesting because the. You know, very intentionally so, the movie's about the rock and roll industry coming of age while this teenage boy's coming of age. Mm-hmm. It's all there. But as far as his, his corruption, it's it's not really there. No. He doesn't really do anything. He loses his virginity but, of three girls, and it's like, yeah. great. <laughs> like, that's it. He has a... In the, it's very subtle, but in the in the director's cut, there's a very soft touch, little tiny thread running through it. If he steals stuff all over the place. Yeah. Mm-hmm. He grabs stuff and puts yeah, it in his yeah. bag. That's not in the theatrical, but... Yeah. Um, but it, it, it that's that's fun. But that that's that's just mischief. That's not like a fifteen year old kid getting addicted to cocaine. Well, I've seen, I, you know, I've, I've, I grew actually. I feel like I grew up on these movies, even though I couldn't name one of like the overbearing mother, and that's being, and you know, the person writing that being like, I, we can all relate to that because everyone's mother's overbearing, and he's he wrote this ma- mother that's so overbearing, and, she, and then finds a way to make it like, damn, she's, she's a good mom. Yeah. She's wonderful. She's a really good mom. I yeah. I, I actually. Oh man, those scenes between them—they legitimately get me so. I can't watch it in like a room with people who might <laughs> judge might judge me for cool. for for crying. But like, yeah. but like the uh, I first time I saw that movie, I was in I was in high school. It's probably just a little bit older than William is in the movie, and I saw it with my mom in downtown San Diego, where the movie was shot. Mm-hmm. So it was really intense to watch that, like, with your mom, where it was, sh- like, literally mm-hmm. down the street, the first cafe between him and Lester Bangs, Sun okay. Cafe, that was literally one block from the theater I saw it in, with my mom. 
as you're hitting that yeah. age where you're like starting to like call at two in the morning. Hey, I'm staying I'm out. Sorry, can I stay out yet? They're <laughs> like, I hate you for this, and, but okay. And on top of that, yeah. on top of that, I'm seeing a subculture that was my mom's subculture. Mm-hmm. You know right, that yeah. that that, ro- that era of rock and roll is my parents' era of rock and roll. Mm-hmm. And I mean, can you imagine like if your kid starts becoming a skater, and you're just like, oh man, I really don't want my kid to be a I don't mind if he skates. I just don't want him to be a pothead all his life. And there's, like, no preventing that. Imagine if it's the same thing, but with, like, rock and roll. And yeah. you're just like, okay, I can't stop him from this. And that's actually what's so cool is she's this crazy overbearing mother, you know, and they, they show the sister running away. And yeah. and um, and then she does, like, the coolest thing ever. Let's him skip school to go on tour. Like, no parent will do that. But you still kind of get it. You get it where she's just like... Oh, you just gotta let him be a kid, but I'm still gonna hate every second of it. Yeah, you know, it's like if she it's... doesn't let him go, something worse will happen. Yeah, and then of course the whole like, is this in the theatrical cut? The, the your mom freaked me out. I don't think your it mom is. called. She freaked me out. Yeah, you know yeah, yeah, that's it. Theatrical. Okay, yeah, yeah. Um, that uh, that of course is just like I don't know, just piecing it together. Um, yeah. She could have been really easy as just like oh, an antagonist. And instead, like, it's not really that. The antagonist yeah. of the film is, I mean, the mom pokes at it, but she's a little bit more of, like, a, a lovable punchline, you know, and punchline's the wrong word for a character, but you get what I mean. That's how she's used, um, She's the, sort of the comic button yeah. for all of that stuff. Yeah. And it's funny, because the first time I saw it, uh, and Zoe Deschanel does her little expressing why I need to leave through dance scene, yeah. the audience is kind of going, oh God, like they were squirming, it just didn't, because it's early in the film and you don't really know how to take it and the vibe hasn't been established It feels yet. like twee And kind just of. like, this is going to go, This if this yeah. is that movie, this is going to go terribly wrong. But it only makes sense in retrospect once you see that, like, of course her mom would have allowed her to do that. That's mm-hmm. like, that's the kind of mom she is. And in 1973, it's not that bad. Like, it's not a cliche yet. Mm-hmm. It's just someone who is trying to let their her kids find their way, um, has very strong opinions about how they should be doing it. And mm-hmm. yeah, McDormand is amazing because you just for a, you don't for a second believe she isn't thinking over everything afterwards and beating herself up about what she did or didn't do. Mm-hmm. But she performs that role for her kids, like she performs the severe mom. Mm-hmm. And it's like every actor in this movie is is amazing and just fascinating to watch. But. Yeah. McDormand, I think, because she's playing someone we've all kind of known, just gets right in there right away and, and takes root. It's, yeah, yeah, yeah. She's she definitely she definitely stands out. We're talking about performances. Can we talk about Patrick Fugit's kid performance in that? Sure. Yeah. Maybe the I'm best terrified kid of kid actors. I'm like so scared of the day we have to work with a kid actor. <laughs> oh my god, they're always He's, bad. Like even in like Spielberg movies, they're like kind of bad. You know, but it's yeah. it's fascinating. I mean, he's he. You know, they, they 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 found this kid. He was plucked, literally plucked out of obscurity, out of a casting call. Thousands, thousands of kids, and they mm-hmm. find this kid, and he's just, it's just him. He's just got it, and he's able to bring that in front of a big thirty-five millimeter camera with huge lights everywhere his first time. That's yeah. true. The intimacy That's, is very different now. Like you can shoot a movie with a still camera, and people kind of react to it differently, and they don't notice, and they don't act up the same way. But yeah, that was a big, expensive production, and there's a child at the heart of it. It's mm-hmm. true. I never, and because of the story and the, and the way the movie works, I don't think of him that way. I just think of him as a very small, you know, focused adult, which is probably how Crow managed to pull off the whole thing mm-hmm. as a kid and get on and do it. Yeah. But yeah, he's he's potentially a void, but I think he's attentive and he's a sponge on screen, and mm-hmm. you somehow feel that, like you feel the watchfulness, and maybe it's part of the tone of the film itself as well. Yeah. The I, you know this is my story and I never forgot it. Like that was the summer that changed everything. Yeah. It's such a cliche, but this is the movie where it actually plays out as real. Yeah. And well, another thing that I, that I think about with, you know, with Patrick Fugit being the, the centrifuge as it were of mm-hmm. the film, um, the, you know, if you think about how you're, you know, you're building your narrative structure and you, you know, you want to tell the story that ultimately ends up being about the band, even though it is, or I'm sorry, ends up being about him even though, you know, I mean, all it really is is a kid tagging along with a band and he's just watching the band with eyes wide open and that's it, you know, I quoted them on purpose. Um, Creed? Yeah. Anyways, but yeah, so he's just watching, uh, he's watching what happens and of course he has his own trials and tribulations and all of that. But when I think about that movie, you would think that like in just retrospect, you'd just be like, oh yeah, that's that movie about that that band, you know? And, you know, but when I think of the 
the core of the movie, I don't think Penny Lane and Billy Crudup. I think, I think about Patrick Fugit, you know, yeah. which is pretty cool, um, because I feel like even more the camera rests on the other people than, than, uh, than him. Yeah. So. Uh, what's Billy Crudup's character's name? Russell. Russell Hammond. Russell Hammond. Russell Hammond. Nice. Yes. So, so Billy Crudup is is Russell Hammond. There, there's so many like obvious ways to portray elites uh, that will the guitarist with mystique of the band as they call him. Mm-hmm. And um, he is, that character is so freaking likable and beyond the idea of like, oh, he's magnetic because he's a rock star and he's mysterious. He's not really mysterious by the end of the movie. You, you get him entirely and it's yeah. those little private moments between him and this little kid about talking about like, like um, is it the Marvin Gaye woo? Yeah. Or is it, is it, is yeah. it you know, yeah. the, that woo. one woo? That one? Yeah. And he's like, I know the woo. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then, and then, and then, and then later when he has that really frank discussion, he's like, you know, turn off the recorder. He's like, here's the thing. Um, these things are getting bigger and bigger and bigger. All these guys have families. And there's a lot of stuff that happens that, you know, he has like this very frank discussion with this kid. Mm-hmm. And it's in all these moments that, that uh, you start liking him so much more than you would like just a guitarist with mystique. Right. Yeah. And then, I mean, um, I mean, I know we're just regurgitating scenes from the yeah. movie, but but there's the uh, I, I just remember feeling you could see him going to a high school party as like a dangerous burnout yeah. sort of like sign, and instead you just love him for it for doing it, you know. And it seems like you could have taken it as like that's the darkest moment where he really fucked up, and instead when you watch it, you feel like. Yeah, I mean, that's he's finally just kind of diving back into something, you know, he's getting his innocence back in a way, you know, where, whereas, you know, he couldn't just do that anymore. He couldn't go to a place where people are um, not there because they're, like, leeching off of him. Well, they're still amazed he's there, but, yeah. you know, they're not, like, there to party with him and because they're, you know. And it's, yeah, I, I think that, like, the for example, Jim Morrison and, and Oliver Stone's The Doors, I think that's kind of the not as good way to yeah. do it. You know, I, I never I never really connected with that character in that movie. I don't and think you can. Like, yeah. I think the whole point of Oliver Stone's approach was the, it's almost a didactic, you have to be reminded over and over again, this man is a god, this man is beyond you, he sees things you don't see. And so everyone around him has to say, oh, I didn't see that. that thanks, Jim, for illuminating that. It's, you know, it's what mm-hmm. Jake Kazan's making fun of in, in Walk Hard. Yeah, the, yeah. Oh, you really got that, didn't you? you know, that, that, that whole <laughs> reflexive genius thing. But yeah, I, what happens I, here is a lot more casual, a lot more oh, human, a lot more understandable and relatable. Yeah, in the cinema world, I like Russell Hammond so much more than Jim Morrison. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I watch it. Also, I, I don't even know if Russell Hammond is like actually a talented artist. That's true. That's an that's an interesting one yeah. too. Is you're not really idolizing. You're maybe idolizing the lifestyle, and that's and it's a deconstruction of that as well. Mm. But I'm but I'm not really really sure they're even all that good of a band yeah you know? we're not exposed to enough of their music yeah really which is like, great it's in there it's around but yeah, yeah but i'm pretty happy about that because yeah. again that that would be the part that that driving to school listening to pirates of the caribbean wouldn't care about <laughs> you know be like oh there's that part i'm gonna fast forward to you. <laughs> there's a there's a movie out or it's on disc now it's called song song one um it's kind of okay. It's an American attempt to do once with Dan Hathaway's a woman who meets a rock star and they hang out together and stuff. The songs were written by Jenny Lewis and her partner, whose name I can never remember. And they're sung by men. And it's really weird because you spend a lot of time with the music and you think, oh, I almost love this. What's wrong with it? And then at the end, you find out it was written by Jenny Lewis. It's like, oh, well, there you go. That's exactly why that didn't work. Hmm. It was sung by the wrong person. And with Stillwater, we don't have that. Like, there's no sense that the band is an entity. I mean, there is a sense that the band is an entity, but we never understand their personality beyond kind of like Led Zeppelin in an alternate universe. And mm-hmm. even that doesn't make sense because they're not English. Mm-hmm. Um, I like that. I love the fact that he is just futzing around with our expectations of what music would have been like in 1973 and, and denying us all that stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So was there any... Um, like what? What bands did you think of? Were there because ta- you guys are younger than I am, and and clearly your reference points are different. So, what? How did that work on you? I saw it as as it being a, um, a very genuinely. I just I've always seen it as like this is a period piece. This no longer exists. Yeah. But this is trying to capture a time and and communicate it. I don't think that the music industry is anything like that anymore, for better or for worse. Um, but there is the one funny line in the movie where their manager comes in. And he goes, like, if, you, "If you think Mick Jagger is going to be up there doing that, yeah. you know, thirty years from now, you guys, you guys got to check yourselves." Yeah. 
<laughs> and of course, it's Fallon. So yeah, it's your, yeah, 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 yeah. And it's your bizarre right. boomerang because the casting is dead on. Like everybody is is exactly mm-hmm. right for this. Uh, Rain Wilson um, said that he's only made two perfect films. Like he told me that once, and we were talking about Galaxy Quest, and that this was the other one. Oh yeah, he's uh, the Rolling Stone yeah. journalist with yeah. long cigarette. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he said it's like I, no one knows I'm in it, and I'm delighted to be a part of that. And then uh, Galaxy Quest is the one where people say yeah. you're in that. That your hair is different. And he's like, yeah. <laughs> but this is his secret one. People and, people don't remember Zoe Dashanel's in Almost Famous. Yeah. yeah, I feel like I feel like that's like a yeah. I, I, for, wait, I forget like a, what. Yeah, no, that's true. Yeah, well, you don't think of and then she was just blowing up, right? Like all the real girls was the next I don't year or something. I think she was like years up. away from. I it. think she was still years she away. Was, I knew. I think she blew she up in like 2006 or yeah. something like that. You know, like because I she was an indie fixture for like two or three years before. Five hundred. I guess five hundred days of summer was the big. That one, was right? her big one. Yeah, yeah. but well, I she knew... was also like quirky roommate in like Matthew McConaughey movies. Yeah. Like oh God, like, failure to launch. That was what I, I didn't want to oh, name it because oh. I didn't want anyone to know I knew it. Oh my God! No, we all saw it. That's the one where they pretend to put a dog to sleep for a comedy. Yeah. yeah. I someday I will. And Matthew them. McConaughey and someone that isn't. Oh man, I Kate Hudson. Say it. Yeah, no, no, it's supposed to be Kate Hudson, but it's not. They got, it's not. Yeah, they got Sarah Jessica Parker. Yeah, she's not like that good looking, but there's like. Like Matthew McConaughey, not never mind. Yeah, let's no, not talk about this. There, there's a there is a second alternate universe where Matthew McConaughey never reinvented himself and is still yeah. making those movies. And I like I'm terrified one day that the portal will open and all of those movies will yeah. still have it. Yeah, the McConaughey will will end and he'll yeah. just be back to being like, can I be like an attractive young older man again? Yeah. Like, I want to do a movie where I don't have to wear a shirt. Uh-huh. And maybe ladies look at me. Yeah. All right. <laughs> young young ladies I'm, look I'm at like, me with awe. I'm, yeah. I'm like a I'm like a jet ski instructor. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like a jet ski instructor. <laughs> All right. See now the joke will be making a movie where the ca- where one of the characters is a producer of McConaughey like comedies. That's where you take that. That's actually kind of brilliant. <laughs> Like like the frustrated producer who's actually an artist, you know, but he yeah. all but he only has one thing, one vehicle, and that vehicle is yeah. someone like Matthew McConaughey who's just like, I just got to take off my shirt, like I got to do it, <laughs> That's right. and then he like goes on a renaissance. It's a runner, anyways making a movie about the film industry sounds like crap, but that's uh, a <laughs> that that, that they make funny. so many of them. I know. Um, I think also uh, more in the direction point of view. I think that almost famous uh, that movie is told extremely simply. Like, I couldn't, you know, I couldn't just look at it and like, tell you who the DP was or something like that. Or, or you know, there's, there's nothing really like, like a crazy montage or anything like, like a drug trip. or there's, It's a very, very simply told film that just kind of executes the story as well as possible with the characters and with the script and all of that. And, um, and it stands the test of time, and it probably will forever, especially considering that it's a period piece that, that'll help um, lock it in, you know, so it's not going to age. Um, but I think that's something that's a takeaway just being that, uh, that, um, substance definitely trumped style in that case. And in many cases, you know, in a lot of, a lot of other movies you see, like a lot of Linklater stuff is substance over style. And, um, yeah, it's, it's a, it's hard to, it's, it's really hard in a, in a world where most movies that, that the average person raves about are are the opposite you know of just like man did you see that sweet shot you know like that kind of thing and you're just like who cares you know no matter how sweet it was you know it's um it's really nice to see that it's like okay that movie people will talk about a lot right now and forget but like something like almost famous will probably just stick around no matter what you know i mean whereas even star wars a new hope will eventually like get older and older and older looking and everything will be more and more transparent and you know the 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 Jungian arp- archetypes will persist and that'll probably still stick in our imagination but ultimately like there's going to start being more and more false beats and worse and worse less and less impressive effects and all of that yeah. um and that's you know one of our great great movies yeah, so. yeah, it's funny. I I, I was at a I, now does a free flick series in in town, and we did the first one on Monday. I just introduced the digital restoration, but still of Raiders uh-huh. uh, to an audience, and it was the thing where it's like that's a period piece made in 1981 about the 30s, and 
there are no tells. Like it's cool. not like the Mark Hamill's hair in Star Wars, where it's just like, oh, it's nineteen seventy seven. Yeah, like, there's no question yeah. when that happened. I'm so glad to hear you say that yeah. because I was really worried that you're about to say what I said about A New Hope about Raiders. Oh, because I was no. like, no, Raiders totally holds up. What are you talking about? Yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah. No, Raiders and Jaws are still perfect. Yeah, I examples. feel because I grew up on Star Wars and I and I watched it recently and I was like, this isn't like the acting is like kind of bad. Like, the writing's kind of bad. I don't even know why this works. I mean, it works. It definitely works. Star Wars. I, I grew up on it. I love Star Wars. Oh, yeah. But, but It's no longer as pure as it used to be. Yeah, like I can't just felt... watch that for enjoyment anymore. That would be an academic exercise. Yeah. Now. Raiders doesn't have that. Yeah. And, and... Raiders is still just so much fun. We watched, actually... Another movie we watched, um, actually, here in Toronto, we were... Um, we just had a really, really long night, and we, you know, caught a few hours, and then we, we all went out to breakfast... And up on the screen at the bagel place uh, was the beginning of Back to the Future. Oh, and we just sat in the bagel place for like an hour and a half and watched it. Yeah. We just watched the holds whole thing. up really well. Oh, it's great. It was yeah. like, oh, this is one of those movies that will will always be around. You know? That's yeah. cool. I have been sucked into that when it's on television, like full frame with commercials. Yeah. And this was back when like the laser disc, the DVD, the, DVD, the tapes were all right there on yeah. the shelf. And I'm just like, well, if I get up, it'll, it'll stop. stop. And I don't want to yeah. do that. So I'll I don't want to like, the... go catch up to the story. Yeah. yeah. You watch the broken version and it's almost as good. So I'm assuming you both originally saw the theatrical cut first? I did. Okay. No, um, I don't remember it. Because it was, was years was before younger. it surfaced. Yeah. So, yeah. obviously, the dumb question. How did the, like, the experience of revisiting... Because I'm fascinated by director's cuts, both for what they restore and for what they choose to cut in the first place. Yeah. And with Crow, I always get the sense that he could go on for a lot longer. Like, there's mm-hmm. the whole... There's all the Billy Wilder stuff he wanted to do for Jerry Maguire, where he would play the agent, and there would be mm-hmm. so much more commentary. I think they shot most of it, but while Vanilla the Sky has a big... A big that's, one as well, yeah. That's right. Um, and we're apparently about to get that on Blu-ray. There's another. Oh, there's a. What? There's a Vanilla Sky Blu-ray coming out in like in two months. Oh, there we go. and, and that's a know, director's cut. I don't know if it's a director's oh cut gosh. or if there's extra material, but there's something going on. Oh, because I I actually think Vanilla Sky is a really underrated film. Yeah, I oh. think I think it was perceived at the time as a fall from grace after Almost Famous, but I mean. That's a good ass movie, oh, Vanilla Sky. There's nothing to be ashamed of yeah. there. That's I don't actually. Well, I think I think it was that the end felt like a gotcha ending. Mm. Whereas I personally don't. I don't see it that way. I yeah. think it's like a really, a really well built, a really well built climax. Yeah. I mean, I'd seen the original, and so I was like, I was fine with it, and mm-hmm. I was fine with it in the original too. But what, what bugged me was just the flatness of Cruz's like a Cruz Penelope Cruz's performance because it's amazing. She's playing the same character and she's struggling so much with not with the character but with the dialogue and not even the language just the way you know in another life when we're both caps it's just the whole room was wincing uh-huh. it's yeah. almost too earnest which is what crow does yeah but that material is harder and meaner and deals with death and betrayal and you know all the stuff that cameron diaz puts him through in the first act i don't know that you can go sweet in that movie the same way he does so i'm, yeah. I'm wondering if it's just a disconnect I, between i know exactly what you mean and i think i i give it a pass that may be an incorrect pass but i've always given it a pass on that because um because of the reveal mm-hmm. because you find out that so much of this is a construct yeah. of a guy making an idealized life an idealized woman an idealized self all yeah. these things that those things made more they made more sense and in fact i was like that's kind of brilliant cameron cameron crow directing tom cruise and this sweet woman and then you find out it's like oh it's <laughs> It's just a, it's someone, mm-hmm. it's someone's wish fulfillment. Yeah. Um, I think that's why, that's why it worked mm-hmm. for me. But you know, what's funny is, um, I wonder what... I, and I, I overall, I thought it was better. I liked it more than Aubrey Los Ojos. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I didn't think Aubrey Los Ojos was bad at all, but I liked more the emphasis on pop culture and Vanilla Sky where like, for example, showing like where he created that walk down the street was a Dylan, Bob Dylan yeah. album cover and things like that. How, cause I think. I wonder if I do that. I wonder if my memories get composited with romantic imagery I've seen. Mm-hmm. I think I wonder if other people think. I don't know. Like Probably. things, scenes oh, I've seen sure movies, and yeah, you know, I do it all the time because I can't remember anything at all, <laughs> and so I'm sure that I've I've constantly mixed. Like, did that happen? Well, I mean, it, it's actually even one of those kind of strange things about living in Los Angeles, is. Um, well, you're literally living in a set mm, yeah. at the time, like, yeah. and like so you can you, you can be in the grocery store and be like, "Oh, that's my friend from um, 
Oh, where did I meet that guy? Oh, that's right. I watch a TV show and he's on it. Yeah. You know, and I don't know him at all. <laughs> yeah. And thank yeah. God I didn't say anything. Yeah. Or like catch eye contact and try to, you know what I mean? Like, and, oh, yeah. And it's yeah. kind of like that. I, in, uh, that's kind of like the end of Vanilla Sky. It was just like, how do we, and you know, you define yourselves in that way and sometimes, um, which is kind of bizarre, especially when it's like, oh, I don't, I don't want to know that celebrity. I just thought I knew that guy. You know yeah. what I mean? I'm, I don't have like a fantasy of being his friend. That's weird. Yeah. It's I just the, thought I knew him. You it's know? the TV thing. I mean, television's in your home. They're in mm -hmm. your home. Like, if you spend enough time with someone on a show watching them being human, because like, yeah. that's what television does better than movies, or at least it used to. Now it's all changed because of the frame size and the way people relate to their entertainment. But, you know, like um, I've, I've met Bran Cranston twice. The first time was before the the last seasons of Breaking Bad, and he's this working actor who's, oh, I'm incredibly lucky to be playing Walter White, and it's fantastic, and we're going to have some great stuff coming up this season. And then the show ends, and I bumped into him. Uh, that was a proper interview. And then the second time, it was an unexpected, like, I, you guys were probably here. It was during the festival last year. Mm -hmm. uh, and he was here with Jay Roach casting his Trumbo project. He wasn't in anything. He was just Wait, here. Brian Cranston was here when we were here, and yeah. we didn't get to see him. No. He's one of the few. He's one of the few. It's like him and Daniel Day Lewis, where I just feel like, I'm a, okay, I'm going to be honest, I'm a little bit starstruck. Breaking Bad's the best thing of all time. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, that's pretty incredible. Yeah, it's like this thing that exists beyond its genre, beyond its form. Um, like the same way that I mean, really, the same way Almost Famous occupies that space for for Rain Wilson, where he loves it so much, and he was just lucky enough to be in it, mm -hmm. and which is how Crow feels about you know the the Zeppelin tour, and and he made this movie because of that happening for him. It just it's like it goes on and on and on, and it all comes back to devotion, like this thing that you love so much, you got to capture and yeah. be a part of. Yeah, and, and, and it's this oh, beautiful and, testament. And so what's also so beautiful is how something that personal gets made on that scale. You know, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. rare. He talked and, the studio into making it, and then releasing and, his cut even after that happened. Yeah, and and so and and not even hiding it, just being like, this is, it, and it's so weird because it's like it doesn't even for some reason come across as self-important for Cameron Crowe to be like, I made an autobiographical movie, because yeah. it's wonderful and everything about it is so honest and so mm -hmm. earnest and and it's so well done. I I always forget that it's autobiographical. Yeah, yeah. normally they end up kind of self-involved, especially when it's up by a filmmaker. You know, that's always when it's like, oh come on, you know. <laughs> But um, I don't know. Maybe I just like hate the filmmaker's life because normally it's like the best life in the world. So if they ever like have to complain about it by making a movie about it, yeah. but for some reason he's just oh, it's not about that at all. It's just about love of you know coming of age and love and all of that. Yeah. So that's nice. Well, and he diffuses it beautifully with the uncool theme. Like yeah. it's just there's no way he this. I wonder if this is the first humble brag. Like this is the original humble brag. It's like I am kind of cool. Now. I made this happen. <laughs> I made this now because this <laughs> happened to me. Yeah. You don't know. I know. Those those Philip Seymour those Philip Seymour often scenes. You can just watch them over and over and yeah. over, and they're just they're incredible every way yeah. you look at them. Yeah. And, and they're uh, like a perfect short film. They lift right out too. You could just assemble them and show that in a class, and it's like this is what you do if you ever get this kind of part. Do that. Just don't do anything else. Yeah. Be yeah. that guy. Th those scenes are another great example of something that if you cut out just a little bit too early, it would feel like. He was the kid who was being preached to, mm -hmm. or, or, the filmmaker was preaching, but he just slips in this humor to deflate it. No matter how intense it gets, like towards mm -hmm. the end, whether it's whether it's of course I'm I'm uncool I'm home, or it's kids on drugs, yeah. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. <laughs> like you know like yeah. it's it's so perfectly perfectly timed. So can we talk about like w without spoiling the ending? Can we talk about why the ending of Almost Famous is brilliant too? Sure. No one gets the girl. Yeah, that's true. I mean, we there is an assumption going into this that people will have seen the movies in yeah. question. But okay, yeah, yeah, so no one gets it. the girl, and yet it is the most emotionally satisfying ending. I wouldn't no have liked even... it if, she, if anybody got the girl. I would yeah. have been really unsatisfied. And also, like, Penny Lane, not that she really needed one, but she kind of gets a redemption yeah. by making the thing happen that needed to happen, like yeah. the honest moment between the two of them after so much had kind of become... a bit of a facade between them you know yeah um so beyond not knowing getting the girl like she becomes the hero of the whole situation you know and everyone is somehow able to redeem themselves in just the most charming way possible yeah and that, that, i mean that phone call between uh between her and russell where um he calls her up and oh, he's yeah. like it's a, and it's yeah. you, because you're watching a cameron crow movie i think it works especially well 
because you, you're expecting, you know, say anything or something. Here's a guy. He's pouring his heart, heart out. out. Here right. it is. I'm coming to you. All these things. And she's like, okay, write down the address. And you think you're getting, you're getting that ending. You're yeah. getting, you know, the the Cameron Crow male in love ending. But right. what you're really getting the is the guy a, who made say anything after all. And you're always kind of figuring. And Jerry Maguire had already happened by that point. Right. Yeah. Jeremy, the Jerry Maguire scene. Yeah. You know, yeah. the trajectory's all there. Wife. Yeah. 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 Exactly. And then, and then when he gets to the door. And that moment between the mother and Russell. And then the sister, too. Where she's and the like, sister's <laughs> <laughs> like, hello. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. And then the two of them finally in the room, finally getting the, uh, the, the interview. He's like completed, I mean, from like a textbook standpoint, our hero has kind of completed his journey. And we've gotten this like, again, it's so honest, um, so unconventional. And yet no one could argue that it's not emotionally satisfying to a very wide audience yeah do you think that the ending was always like that or do you think it was one of those things he was just sitting in front of like just finishing out the third act and he's just like damn what is gonna happen right now and like writes it where one of them gets the girl and crosses it off and I don't, writes a cynical ending I don't know but here's something interesting the, there's a book of Cameron Crowe interviewing uh, Billy Wilder mm-hmm. I think it's called Conversations and um, I read that book, and th- there's a point where Cameron Crowe gets a little bit more personal about himself with Billy Wilder. And he's like, hey, look, I have this screenplay. And he doesn't say in the book which one it is, but it was written, I think it was around the time he was probably writing Almost Famous. Mm. And he just says, like, I have this screenplay, and there's something in the third act not working. And Billy Wilder's like, well, then there's a problem in the first act. And then, <laughs> like, they come back to the next interview. He's like, you're right. There was a problem in the first act, and then I figured it out. And then That's I figured really out cool. the, the ending to this uh this story hmm. so maybe it was that one and maybe maybe he he solved it by interviewing Billy Wilder oh, I can see that yeah he's Billy like Wilder. an interview with Billy Wilder an interview <laughs> an interview <laughs> <laughs> yeah um, actually weirdly enough uh, I'll tell you two stories really quick about this sure. right when we right when I said that I looked up and just to give you a visual there are I, how many blu-rays am I looking at right uh, now no it's several thousand yeah several thousand blu-rays just just in on a huge wall in front of me and right when i said the word interview my eyes went to the blu-ray of the interview up there oh nice and then actually just a few moments ago and it's kind of bizarre and that's why i have to tell it i wouldn't have even told that if it were just one but um but i was just thinking um about like uh rain wilson sitting through the movie the first time and he's like, oh, this is actually like a good movie, thank God, because sometimes you just don't know when oh, you're yeah. an actor. You just you just hope they don't screw it up, you know. And um, and I remember thinking that when I was uh, I was a colorist on this movie called Absentia, and the guy and I was thinking about that being sitting in the audience, being like, oh, this is actually like a good movie. I really I really enjoyed this. And then um, you know, and then he and then I was thinking like, and then he went on to do Oculus, and literally as I thought it. <laughs> I looked at you, and right behind your head is Oculus. Yeah. And I was like, that's incredible! So, anyway, I just looked back and saw Kill List. Okay. My eyes went directly to it, and that is a very good choice, my friend. Good yeah. one. Uh, Let's just talk about every movie that stands <laughs> yeah. out now. Oh, Ben, we would okay. be so great on this show. Since oh, you yeah. saw the interview, uh-huh. can we draw any parallels between, between the interview? <laughs> between between uh, uh, Jason Lee's lead singer character, Russell Hammond, the guitarist of Mystique, and... Kim Jong and, and Seth and Seth Rogen and yeah. Kim Jong Un and and uh, James Franco in uh, in the interview, both kind of funny. They're both kind of. Funny. Well, I think clearly Crow was trying to craft a, a very uh, layered uh, allegory for North Korea and the fact that they're unknowable. Well, I think that's obvious. And, uh, he knew that they would be like big time trouble later on. They're yeah. just like they're just rattling their sabers right now. But... Yeah, and that saber rattling sounds like seventies rock. Yeah. So you know, <laughs> Fleet, they're the Fleetwood Mac of it. Actually, you've seen something else. I, I think it's did a thing. I, I'm wondering, almost famous. I, I, uh, I don't know if um, Billy Crudup and Jason Lee's character uh, actually hate each other or not in the movie. There's one final scene between them where they basically say it out loud. They're like comparing themselves to other relationships and banks. Oh, like, like, like each other. They yeah. tell each other. They all, they all hate each other. And then, uh, and then I think they like go to like hug it out. Or like they kind of miss really awkward, and it's yeah. really awkward mm. and then, then they just kind of like smile at each other and start laughing yeah, yeah. and it's 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 really interesting um, and the, like the girlfriend wife swapping without each other knowing yeah, <laughs> thing. yeah. 
like that's like the stuff they expect from themselves, right? Because it's the seventies rock thing. They have to do that. The the expectations of stardom. Right? That's what. That's where you inevitably end up. You have to be debauched, or else you're not a real rock star. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, that's part of the mythology that the film takes apart, just completely dismisses. And I think, like, I think those guys do love each other because they sing "Tiny Dancer" together, and it's genuine, and it's a moment of forgiveness, and like that's that's the Cameron Crowe, the big you know you complete me scene it's so yeah. it's so completely self-consciously mm-hmm. sweet and goofy and awkward and uncool that it's an Elton John song and there's nobody in the room who doesn't like it like yeah. there's nobody in the audience who doesn't like that song there's nobody in the bus that doesn't like that song that scene shouldn't work yeah it would be so it shouldn't lame. work it would be so lame it is not <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's no not, it's, it's not. not no i i i think they definitely don't hate each other for sure i think that if they weren't in a band together i doubt they'd hang out I would say yeah. that's probably true. They're work friends. Yeah, I think they're work friends, and that you know they make it work, and that's I think that they they express that pretty clearly in the film there. But it is I, I don't think they hate each other at all. Yeah. I, I think there's some weird angst, but in the same way that like when you work together, there's some weird shit that comes up. Yeah, but uh, but it's yeah, like an old wound over a lyric that one of them screwed up ten yeah. years ago that stayed in the song, and now they're both stuck with it and they're kind of sick of it, like that kind of yeah. thing. You get a sense of history. You get the sense that these guys have maybe been together a little too long, for total comfort and support but they still mm. play great they, they still a band let me ask you a question yeah. do you do you love Penny Lane I don't know yeah. like, even now I don't know like yeah. the whole point of that character is that you can't fully understand her right. and that sort of thing tends to bother me in movies uh, as a character I think she's great as a human being I don't think I'd want to spend a two seconds that's with what her. I'm kind of curious I, I feel like I wish I could maybe like have a relationship with some kind of ethereal you know pixie dream girl that's what she is you yeah know, that's exactly what she is and it's amazing that, that everybody she loves and she's well. so sexy and she seems to just kind of like have an, an, a plan of her own and it's like really cool but i feel like in person i just be like you are so weird get out of here yeah. you know like i don't like it yeah yeah but but I, I but as a as a person that would project himself onto a, onto a movie screen i would definitely say like yeah i think yeah, I think I love Penny Lane. Well, that's why the manic pixie dream girl is a thing. Like she's yeah. the embodiment of a fantasy, and we don't have to take her right. to dinner or sit with her and have her tell us where she got the macrame vest she's wearing. Like, yeah, she yeah. would be insufferable. She probably is insufferable. Is the word? Yeah, she's yeah. probably insufferable. And in- part of that, to my mind, is also because Kate Hudson plays her. And while she's great in this movie, Kate Hudson is absolutely amazing. She's never been as good anywhere else, and now she's kind of like I. I I clench up when she's in a movie these days because there's really only the two modes that she plays in. Mm. And it's like that whatever it is that Crow saw in her hasn't transferred out. Um, where she's just sort of trapped in... Like she she got McConaughey. She's still trapped in she that, in that world got, of romantic yeah, comedies that she's becoming too old for. And it's right. time for the reinvention that hasn't happened yet. Mm-hmm. It's interesting. I, I It's funny you ask that. I've actually never watched the movie thinking... Um, thinking I want that girl but I've always watched it thinking I totally get why that kid wants that girl right huh. but like but not but not deconstructing it while I'm watching it I just go with it because I'm like oh from the point of view of that kid I, I get it entirely yeah. I understand she's 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 everything I mean you get why he'd be so romanced by her and, and all that but yeah but it's weird I've never watched it thinking well wow, I'm really sexually attracted to to that girl right now yeah oddly and she was um, sexualized very heavily. Like the movie does, she's certainly the most appealing, sort of you know the the one of the posters, one of the yeah. the, the DVD cases is just her in, a, in a, an undershirt and panties being. Well, e- even discovered. beyond that is, I mean, she's not the main character of the movie. She may be this the third main, mm. and her face is is the the image of almost famous her wearing the glasses. Yeah, that's um, true. Well, I mean, she's the dream girl. She's the right. she's the goal of the film in a weird way. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it's a false goal, and, and Crow knows it, and eventually mm-hmm. William figures it out too. Mm-hmm. There's a. Uh, I, was, I was just thinking of something about the the relationship between um, Jason Lee and Billy Crudup's characters. I recently read um, Keith Richards' very very long, very impressive autobiography, yeah. and um, he talks a lot about his relationship with Mick Jagger in it. And there's interesting parallels there in those I would the, think, those yeah, those yeah. stories. And basically what happened between him and Mick Jagger was that, you know, in the free love times, there was a lot of sleeping around, there was a lot of stuff, and there was one girl in particular that Keith Richards was really actually in love with, and 
it was his girl and Mick Jagger slept with her and they've he's they've never quite it seems that that was the point that they never quite got beyond that they're kind of like a case study in 60s free love like what what is the emotional thing that can go wrong but the weird thing is is at the same time the thing that's a parallel is because even with that baggage that will not go away um he says outright, if anyone says anything bad about Mick Jagger, I'll just slice their throat. Yeah. <laughs> like, well, that's, that's something that's so odd. Is like, well, imagine, imagine writing, you know, writing your memoirs and then just being like, well, I have to be honest, and at some point, I have to like talk some shit about my friends. Yeah. Like, how do you yeah. do? I, I that I mean that basically will preclude me from ever writing a memoir. <laughs> I would never. Do, I couldn't do it. I'd be like, well, I'm just going to tell all the cool stuff that happened. And none of the the bad stuff, and I, that's just weird. I don't know, yeah. I don't know if I could. The, the especially dark, sad thing in it, though, that I forgot to say was that Mick Jagger says that they, I think, they haven't really had like a real friendly conversation in decades. That's hard. And at the same time, oh, yeah. he's saying, "I love him. Yeah, I and love him." No one knows ever say anything about Mick Jagger ever. But here's the thing: is it went wrong, and we haven't spoken in decades. But oh. don't you dare say something. I, like I think literally as a line, I'll slit your throat. The thing with Erin and I is like Erin usually like if I meet her going I really like her, Erin will just tell her, you know he kills people and he's a whole person all these things but and even if you don't like her, <laughs> but I know you you do it because because um because you said that I'm protecting you yeah because prote- love prote- hurts yeah sure so love hurts yeah. and anyone who would be drawn to you thinking that you kill people is probably going to be yeah. someone you don't want to date for very long yeah. Yeah. So, well, the other the big the other big question that always folds into the show is is how what of almost famous have you guys taken? Like, what of what of the film have you as has anything from the movie influenced you? Inspired you? Have you? St- if you want to find how it has informed our own work, say Spring, for example, you'll notice that Spring has a dramatic pattern of um, of what one might call melodrama, or at least real drama, a real tension between two people, sure. a real personal issue. But that scene will always end with some kind of levity, some kind of joke before we get out of it. And now if you look at the the pattern in Almost Famous, let's just use the example of the scene where William tells Penny Lane that that she was that she was uh, basically traded on the tour for a case of beer. And it's really heartbreaking to her and she's crying. But right before the scene ends, she says, What kind of beer? Yeah. You know, and it's yeah. about that. It's about that dramatic pattern where it's like, yeah, you can have the most dramatically effective scene in the world and make your audience cry, but if you don't if you don't inject some levity at some point before you make that edit you, uh, you maybe you haven't done your job right. I think that's more of a parallel than a takeaway, though. Mm-hmm. There's a uh, there, there's a thing in writing that that I've always carried with me that I I learned. I didn't know I was learning at the time when I first saw Almost Famous, but I've I've since looked back like oh that's probably where where that was picked up, and it was just that um, being emotionally um, honest doesn't always mean being cynical. Mm-hmm. You know that yeah. that you know there's an, another example. There'll be blood is an amazing movie, and it's very honest, and its cynicism is very honest. But I would argue Almost Famous is just as honest. But but it's it, it, it's presenting a point of view that's much more optimistic about yeah. people and their intentions and and life and all these things. And I, and I think that you can do that, and it's not you know it's not always corny. It can be it could be like that. Oh, that was the honest way to tell that story. Those choices made telling the story going forward that. Those were the correct choices, um, that uh, and that that in general it doesn't. It's not absolute that that cynicism defines your movie as being classy. Yeah. Sorry, you were about to say something. I was just thinking. I, I realized another parallel between Almost Famous and Spring, and that um, Almost Famous. You know, you, you have a movie about about rock and roll that the the available exploitation aspects to use a storyteller. Mm-hmm. They're not really featured all that much. Yeah. You know, there's there's actually it wouldn't be anything wrong if there was, but there's not that much. There are people smoke some weed and there's a little bit of drug use and there's like a little bit of sex, but there's a lot of people that would have chosen to take in those elements and just really like like yeah, you know, it's, it's like just like go for it. Like how do I keep my audience's attention? How do I keep my audience's attention? More sex drugs, more sex drugs. Or sex even drugs. worse, just like how do I moralize on be- becoming yeah. a, the darkness of becoming a rock star? Right? Yeah. Right. And yeah. and and so but but ultimately the focus is the focus is the self discovery of this kid and, and even the, the adults around him in this whole process. That's really what the movie's about. It's about those relationships. That's the thing about spring is like the, our third act of spring could have been um, just okay, we got a monster. Yeah. Just use those elements. Blood, guts, boobs, monster fighting, 
fighter run, that whole thing. Mm-hmm. Mediterranean Italy, it's going to be a crazy third act. You yeah, know? yeah, yeah. Towns people with torches. I mean, anything yeah, is possible. Anything, right? anything. The doors yeah. open. The uh, secret organization of of uh, <laughs> Monster people that metabolize yeah. on Oh, but I actually do but, want to see that movie, though. <laughs> like, the idea that every 20 years is a new generation of people is like, I don't know, Dad, I'm not sure I'm ready. No, get her, get her. <laughs> I kind of want to see great. that. But yeah, that's it's also the end of Jeepers Creepers 2, so let's not... Oh, no. Yeah. That's, Thanks for the spoiler alert. No, spoiler alert. The monster doesn't die. <laughs> ever. Sorry. We, we have a... Uh, but, you know, we, we have this movie about Oscar Crowley, and the script's done, and it's out there. So we've, we've spent a year, year and a half researching him and, and figuring out the best way to tell his story. It's really interesting, because there are so many things there that that you could exploit. And these like these elements of like ah, do you keep buying attention? More sex, more drugs, more sex, more drugs. You can't tell a story about Alistair Crowley without having those things. But it's interesting because you need those things as a device in the story to explain what he was as as a ceremonial magician and all sure. these things. Yeah. And I think it's I I think that it's it's an odd one because it it's meant to be it's not meant to be like a titillating like oh my god we might be losing their attention let's put some nudity and some drugs or let's moralize it or anything like that. Um, it just has to be there quite a bit to the point where you just get kind of like, it becomes a, just a tool yeah. for him in the movie. Um, well, you would, de- you would be as a person in that world, you'd be desensitized to it. The audience might not be, but you, yeah, it would be another day at the office. Yeah. It's part of mm-hmm. dropping them into that subculture and there's nothing you can do to shock people anymore. Anyways. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Well, it's funny. You mentioned Crow's restraint and almost famous and the parallel, like the flip mirror movie that I always think about is boogie nights. Which is similarly huh. workaday about the uh, the industry, mm-hmm. but it's just a couple years down the road, and a lot of the same people kind of cross over. Like not mm-hmm. necessarily the same actors, but the, the definitely the personality types. It's entertainment. Yeah. It's a little seedier, maybe. It didn't work out as a music manager, so you went into porn production. Like there's a there's a continuity and a, a kind of common humanity in both films as well, but it's way more confrontational yeah. and people and it's die cynical. and it's violent it's and it's cynical. incredibly cynical it's the Scorsese to this is if this is the Spielberg mm-hmm. you know, like it, well it's almost like almost famous as weed and <laughs> but <United's> cocaine <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's, actually it's, a pretty good point yeah, yeah. yes yeah. <laughs> and neither of them is ready for heroin because that will end everything like that <laughs> just ruins the careers of everybody who touches it in wait then movies. in this whole thing what is heroin heroin is Crowley so, <laughs> oh, it's ours. Oh, Sonified, okay, it could be. Well, no, I don't know what heroin... Like, heroin would be the next big destroyer, so what movie is... Spring Breakers. Oh, no, yeah. it's not about a business. Though. They're not ready for it yet. Um, yeah. I don't know. What, something in Wall Street, maybe? Something so toxic Listeners, that Listeners, write in. Yes. <laughs> thanks to Justin Benson and Aaron Moorhead for doing this episode more than seven years ago, and thanks to Leah Visser for setting it up. XYZ Films opens Something in the Dirt in New York and Los Angeles this Friday, November 4th, and Elevation Pictures is releasing it on VOD in Canada November 22nd. It's very good. And go find Spring, too. It's on Plex in Canada, Shudder, Hulu, and Tubi in the U.S., and VOD pretty much everywhere. There's also a very good Anchor Bay Blu-ray out there. You can find Justin and Aaron on Twitter at Justin H. Benson and Aaron Moorhead, all one word, respectively, and you can find Almost Famous on 4K, Blu-ray, and DVD from Paramount Home Entertainment. It's also streaming on Paramount Plus in Canada and on Stars and Direct TV in the U.S., and available to rent or buy on various VOD platforms. As always, you can find me on Twitter at Norm Wilner, and you can find this podcast there at Semcast, S-E-M-Cast, and on the web at someoneelsesmovie.com. The first year of the show is still available for just 20 bucks at payhip.com slash Semcast. That's the first 52 episodes of Someone Else's Movie, 44 of which aren't currently available anywhere else. Oh, and check out my newsletter, Shiny Things, at shiny-things.ghost.io. I think you'll enjoy it. Our theme song is by The Last Year. If you like it or the show in general, please say so. Leave a review wherever you've been listening. Every little bit helps. It truly does. And check out the other shows on the Frequency Podcast Network while you're doing that. Stay safe. Watch movies. Wear a mask if you go out. Get your booster when you can. Hug your loved ones. I'll see you next week. <laughs>